Hi, my name's Simon Cook. I'm a 2018 Nuffield Scholar, and my particular area of study was in biosecurity. The reason I got into biosecurity, and in particular farm gate, stems back to the history uh, of my industry, which is the Kewford industry. So in 2010, our industry got hit by a bacterial incursion called PSA. PSA devastated our industry and uh, wiped out one of our prime cultivars. We were extremely fortunate that we had another cultivar that we could replace that one with and we were able to rebuild our industry. But that was more through luck um, than good management. It was great management that we had a breeding program, but it was sheer luck that the new variety we had was tolerant to this bacterial disease. So that really got me started with an interest in biosecurity. And since then we've seen a number of other incursions hit our country. Bonamia in shellfish, M. bovis in cattle, PSA in kiwifruit, and last year we got hit with fruit fly incursion in Northcote. So my particular area of interest in biosecurity was the farm gate. So when we think of the biosecurity system within New Zealand, we start off with different levels. We start off with offshore, where we look at the pre-border. This is based on international agreements and import health standards, which aim to prevent pests and diseases making their way to New Zealand in the first place. We focus on things like heat treatment for brown marmorated stink bug to try and make sure the pest is dead before it arrives in New Zealand. Within New Zealand, the second level is the border. And so that's probably more obvious to most people when we see things like sniffer dogs at the airport and customs working, and also through the mail department where packages are stopped and looked at. The third is response. And response capacity is built around when a pest arrives in New Zealand, searching for it. So a classic example of that is fruit fly, where all around New Zealand we have 8,000 traps that is, are designed to catch fruit fly. And we actively search for this pest because it's a well-known pest. Unfortunately, these surveillance methods only work for pests that we're aware of and can put traps in place for. There's a whole host of other bacteria uh, or other pests that we don't know about that can arrive in New Zealand. And the problem is if we don't know they're coming, they can be here for some time before we find them. And this is where the fourth level of biosecurity in New Zealand comes in, and that's with the farm gate. That's preventing the spread of these diseases once they're here and before we identify them. And so without that level of biosecurity, without the ability to prevent spread within New Zealand, some of these diseases can be spreading for quite some time. We look at the time period that um, happened within PSA, within the kufa industry, it was here for at least a year before we identified it first. So for that first year, it was able to spread widely. Recently, COVID has given us a classic example of the importance of tracking and tracing and identifying sources of uh, an incursion and trying to track it down and stop it before it spreads any further. So on my travels, I looked at a number of bi biosecurity incursions around the world. One of the ones that really struck home with me was the citrus industry in Florida that got hit with Huang Long Bing or citrus greening. Now citrus greening has caused massive destruction to the citrus industry in Florida. In fact, they lost close to four and a half billion worth of sales over four years. To put that in context, the entire horticulture industry in New Zealand, which employs around 60,000 60, people, is worth about six billion. So it's the equivalent of the New Zealand horticulture industry being wiped out over four years. Since this incursion, America has spent close to a quarter of a billion dollars on research trying to find a cure for this disease, and so far has nothing. So when you travel around Florida, all you see is vacant lots that used to be citrus groves, and it's, it's pretty sad. It reminds me a lot of what we saw in kiwifruit after PSA had hit with orchards being cut out and being taken back down to stumps, and what was a, an extremely depressing time for our industry. And to look at an industry that after four or five years is still going through this was a pretty stark reminder of how lucky we were as an industry in New Zealand to recover. One of the groups I talked to were grapefruit growers, and in particular the grapefruit industry had been exporting up to 140 million boxes of grapefruit up into Japan. After this disease had gone through, they were only exporting 6 million boxes. So some 80 pack houses had been reduced to 10. So that's a wholesale destruction of an industry and a huge amount of lost jobs and careers. One of the other visits I had that really struck home with me was in Queensland, looking at the banana industry. Now a bit of history within the banana industry, 
In the 1950s, all bananas produced worldwide were of the Gros Michel variety. In the 1950s, the disease called TR1, or Banana Panama, started to wipe out these plantations worldwide. In order to survive, because this variety couldn't stand up against this disease, they had to transfer to a new variety of banana, which is the Cavendish variety. And as Gros Michel got wiped out worldwide, the entire world's production of bananas got transferred over to the Cavendish. In the 90s, a new strain of tropical race, or TR4, started to wipe out the Cavendish worldwide and has slowly been spreading. Once again, the Cavendish variety has no uh, ability to survive once this disease is present. And so this disease has slowly been working its way around the world. In the late 90s, it hit Darwin and within a couple of years, completely wiped out banana production throughout Darwin. Just a few hours south of this, on the Queensland coast in Tully, they were still growing bananas. And despite seeing worldwide their industry slowly being wiped out by this disease, they still, in Tully, took no reaction. There was no preparedness for this disease ever arriving there. And not until late 2015, when it finally arrived, did the growers here actually come to terms with the fact that they were susceptible but by then the disease was already in the district and it was too late. They went through the efforts of buying the first orchard that uh, was found with this disease, but by the time they'd done that, it had already spread to several more. If we look at where they're at today, there's now three orchards that have been completely removed within this district. And all the growers there now have strict biosecurity practices for er everything going on and off their orchards. But it wasn't until this disease had struck in their region that they actually took action. And it's great to see now that they do treat each property as a biosecurity zone, where every person going on or off has to go through some sort of bath. They have wash down at the gate, so any vehicle coming onto the property has to be cleaned. And they treat each different site as a biosecurity compound. But it wasn't until TR4 was already in the district and they were already starting to lose orchards before they would put these practices in place. Even though they'd seen worldwide this disease was already having an impact, they still wouldn't act until it was right on their front door. So this to me really reinforced the importance of treating each property as a biosecurity zone and the importance of the farm gate. That if you don't have good biosecurity on your own farm gate, then you're allowing these diseases to spread before you can find them and put practices in place to stop the spread. So in Tully, now they have managed to stop the spread of the disease of TR4, but it's too late because the, the disease is already there and it will slowly, even with the biosecurity practices they've got in place, work its way through the district. And the real secret to it is the time between the incursion and the finding of it. So in New Zealand we saw with Mycoplasma bovis that it was probably in the country for 12 months before it was identified. And dur during that time, it was being spread from farm to farm because there were no controls and no hygiene practices. And so that's the real crux of what we're looking at, is trying to have biosecurity practices in place on farms before an incursion happens. Because by the time an incursion happens, it's too late. And when we look at what's happening worldwide with COVID, it's very much the same story, that New Zealand was lucky that we didn't get the disease until much later than other countries. So we had the opportunity to see what was happening worldwide. And we could see how devastating COVID was. And we were able to put processes in place to shut our border, to prevent the disease coming in. And then when it was here in New Zealand, we could put in track and trace and quickly isolate people and eliminate the disease in New Zealand, which are all standard biosecurity practices being run through people. But it was only through the advantage of time that we could see that this was a problem. That's the key difference between New Zealand and Italy. In, in Italy, they didn't know the disease was coming and it was already widespread before it was there, so it was too late to put these practices in place. And we can see the difference in the outcomes between the two countries. So it's really important that we take the lessons that we're learning at the moment from COVID and apply them to biosecurity practices in general. And that it's really important to have each individual farm treat itself as a bubble and know what's coming on and off and prevent diseases coming on before they arrive. And that we also have strict track and trace procedures so that if there is movement between farms of stock or of plant material, that we can track it so they can easily identify 
if there is an incursion that happens, where they've gone to. And that's basically the fundamentals of my report, uh, is the importance of each farm treating itself as a biosecurity um, border of its own. Thank you.